Leonard, welcome to the show. Great to be here. We, we, we got a fellow Angelino. Uh, tell everyone where here is for you today. Here I am in South Pasadena, beautiful, sunny South Pasadena, California, near Caltech. You know, um, I'll tell you something funny that has a odd tie into the show uh, yesterday, and you'll appreciate this uh, as an LA person where it rains like two days a year. It was absolutely pouring cats and dogs at my house. And we have an issue where we're drain doesn't work and next to my house. And so I was drilling some holes in the side of the wall, basically, because the, the drains all plugged up. And my wife looks at me and she goes, do you know how to spell MacGyver? She's like Googling this. And I'm like, why are you Googling MacGyver? Like, wouldn't you be Googling like water siphon or how to do like, like, why is MacGyver your outlet for the very young listeners? It's a TV show. But then of all the credits you have, I think the most impressive is you have a MacGyver writing credit. How how did a physics guy end up starting to write uh, for, for TV shows in Los Angeles? Uh, well, I've liked writing ever since I was uh, in third grade is, is the first short story I can remember writing. So I've always, uh, always enjoyed writing. And at some point when I found out I was got my first job at Caltech and that I was moving to LA, I decided I would start writing screenplays. And uh, one thing led to another. And uh, I pretty soon I had a, a career where I, uh, I left physics and took a break, at least I've been doing physics my whole life, even after quote, leaving physics, I still publish papers, but I left physics and I uh, had about an eight or nine year career in Hollywood, wrote for MacGyver and Star Trek, the next generation and a bunch of other shows. And uh, that was, that was fun, except that's not the most fun industry to be in. Uh, uh, you know, people know it's kind of a, a problematic uh, industry in some ways in terms of the culture, but it was, it was fun making up stories. And MacGyver was cool and Star Trek were both cool because I could kind of apply my science, uh, although I have to say you have to be very, uh, have a light touch because they were really interested in stories and drama, not more so than science, but, right. but I always snuck in science whatever, wherever I could. I <laughs> now I do the opposite. I try to sneak drama into my science books. <laughs> you know, well, that's, that's why you can bridge the gap so much. Um, I, I joke with a lot of my, uh, you know, despite tech influx and everything else, LA is still very much a media town. And I always joke that like, you know, trying to break in to that world, it's like investment banking as cutthroat and, and challenging. And as uh, much you wrote an entire book on the topic of randomness, uh, you know, some random uh, challenges. I said that like the biggest challenge is it's not nearly as highly compensated <laughs> as banking at the entry level necessarily if you're in the mailroom. Um, but uh, you've you've written a lot of awesome books, some, uh, you know, with people like Stephen Hawking, some about people like Richard Feynman and Times. You have a new book out, which I have um, called Emotional, uh, which my, my camera is not zooming, but listeners will do a show note link to it um, that uh, should be out by the time this drops in January, which I'm excited about. Um, I've read other books of yours, The Drunkards, Walk, etc. But let's, we're going to talk about emotional mostly today. Um, what was the inspiration? You've written a lot of books, pen to paper, you said you like to write, I hate to write. Every time I write a book, I'm like, uh, I, I just I, 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 I only write a book because I can't not write it anymore. It has to like, vomit it out. But you like to write. But what was the inspiration for this one in particular, this topic? Why did uh why why was it uh was it she had to scratch? Well, so some some years ago, uh, I got interested in, in psychology and neuroscience. That must be over ten years ago now. And I, I had been writing science books. I wrote the as you mentioned, the Drunkard's Walk about randomness. Um, I, I wrote a book about curved space, and I wrote work with Stephen Hawking. And as a physicist, uh, there's a certain number of physics books I was interested in writing, but. But after a while, you kind of run out of the physics topics you're excited in. And I, and I was at, uh, on the faculty at Caltech, and a friend of mine was a famous neuroscientist, uh, Christoph Koch, that your, your listeners may, may, have, may know him. He, he studied consciousness, and I got interested in that. I thought it was, it was fascinating to try and understand the human brain. And in that time, uh, it was uh, about, that was 10 or 15 years ago, 
a lot of new technologies were coming online to help study the brain, which was really raising the level of brain study from uh, the, the old behavioral or, or the old um, psychology and laboratory psychology, uh, which wasn't so much a hard science because the, the experiments, uh, well, they're experiments on people where you try to imitate situations. You couldn't really form real situations to experiment on them. And and you're studying their behavior, but now uh, we got to where we can actually measure things and look inside the brain at what's happening. And that opened up a whole new era of psychology. And I got interested in that toward the beginning then. And I ended up writing the book, not on, on consciousness, but on the unconscious mind, which Christoph was very supportive of. And that was my book, Subliminal, about called the unconscious, uh, Subliminal, how uh, your unconscious uh, mind rules your behavior. And that, that was amazing to write that book. I learned so much about myself and that I, things that I've been applying and understanding about myself ever since. And so that got me interested in a certain path. I wrote a book called Elastic after that about how we get new ideas. And then I was talking to another friend, also a Caltech uh, professor, a, a, a famous uh, emotions researcher, a neuroscientist named Ralph Adolphs. And I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a, a book on emotions because I really want to understand myself better. And I love when I write to be able to give that to people, to give them a scientific understanding of themselves, not a self-help, but based in science. I mean, something you can apply to yourself, but that's based in science. And he said, oh, no, no, whatever you do, don't write about emotions. <laughs> I said, why not? He said, oh, because it's undergoing a revolution right now. We're changing all our ideas about emotions. I said, that's it. That's what I want to write. And it was, you know, a good and a bad idea because he had a point that it was an enormous task to, uh, to undertake to understand what everyone was doing and the different camps and the, the uh, different ideas that are there and to synthesize it and make sense of it and to present that. So it took uh, quite a while, but it was an amazingly rewarding uh, process. And uh, I think uh, the book came out great because it's, it's something that's very uh, informative about how you think. It, it changes your thinking, I think, if you read the book, because you understand that emotions are helpful. They're not something to be thought of as the opponent of rational thinking. In fact, they're not even your thinking uh, your quote rational thinking or your reason is not even separable from emotion there's no such thing as pure rational thought in the human brain and how that works and how that helps you in your life and your decisions and your motivation was an amazing thing to to learn and it also gave me the a tremendous opportunity to tell crazy stories because uh the field of emotion by its nature is connected to all kinds of weird stuff so i got stories of people doing head transplants and um, having their friends shoot them. So that's to, to, to uh, garner sympathy from an ex-girlfriend and uh, uh, people trying well, that, to that, induce, that, there's, there's some, there's some very orgasms real world. by stimulating the brain. I, I mean, there's like crazy stuff in there. And, uh, and that made it, made it a lot of fun. Yeah. There's, there's some very real world um, pop culture references in the news recently about some similar sort of things happening where you always kind of shake your head and say, is this real? Is this happening? But, but, you know, um, emotions are a powerful force. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about emotions when it comes to the world of investing and, and money. So, so often as a, as a to, taboo subject in many ways, and I feel like this has changed, but um, you know, chatting about emotions, particularly maybe our, this is a generalization, of course, but but maybe our parents' generation or even their parents, like, it didn't seem like that was as much of a thing and much of a culture where, you know, people would sit down and, and talk, at least, you know, you, the, the beautiful part about your book, you um, speak, you know, quite a bit about your parents. I talk about mine all the time on this podcast. Um, how do you think, you know, the the perception of emotions has changed in, you know, the last couple of decades what are, what are sort of the biggest moving uh, muscle movements? And, and then more recently, like what are, what are we starting to understand about emotions that may not have been really understood, you know, in the past? Well, that's a great question. And I, I do talk a lot about my mother in the book who uh, went, survived the Holocaust and that had a, a, a very uh, strong effect on her. 
And back in the, that day, when I was growing up in the 1960s, uh, to, to feel that you needed help, emotional help, or if you were depressed or anxious or, or, or had some other emotional issue, that was uh, something that people uh, didn't want to talk about and were embarrassed to admit. And they wouldn't want to go to psychiatrists or psychologists. That was considered a, uh, a black mark on your psyche for some reason. So that has changed completely now. I think uh, people are very open about talking about seeing therapists, having therapists, and getting help, not just getting help if you're somehow pathological issue or you suffer from severe depression or some debilitating uh, disorder, but, but even ordinary people who, who need help sorting out their lives. And they, they freely go to therapists and think of, and talk about it. And I think that's a great thing. One of the lessons you learn about emotion is that it's very bad to suppress it, uh, that if you do have excess emotion in certain areas, there are ways to regulate it, but suppression is, is, is not a good one. And that it's it, that one should actually more often go with your emotion rather than run away from it uh, and, and see how it's, uh, it, it can be incorporated into your logical uh, analysis. And in fact, it must be because that's how it works. Um, so uh, that, that has changed a lot since back then. I don't know if writing a book uh, that I did emotional and publishing it in the 60s uh, Maybe people would get secret copies and read it under the table or something. And maybe the breakthrough book came around 1990 uh, on emotional intelligence, where people suddenly um, realized the, import that book, the importance of emotion, which was really the point of that book. And uh, in some ways, this is an, updated, an updating to that because we've learned an awful lot since then. Because in addition to it becoming, let's say, respectable to talk about emotion, our, our view of emotion has been totally changed. Um, since those days, throughout most of Western history, emotion was considered counterproductive and something that you should suppress, avoid, something that gets in the way. Charles Darwin, who created the first scientific theory of emotion, uh, himself believed that emotion was uh, an artifact in humans, that it was important in animals for communicating to each other when there's danger or for communicating uh, their power to other animals in a, in a confrontation and so forth. But Darwin believed that uh, since humans have logical reasoning uh, developed in their brain, that we've, that we've outgrown emotion and that we should try to avoid it and have, quote, cold logical reasoning. And, and what we've learned is that that's not true at all. The way to look at emotion is that um, your mind is a information processor. Uh, not not a computer of the traditional type, but a, a but 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 still an information processor that takes in uh, data about your environment, uh, whether it's the temperature around you or noise or someone talking to you or whatever it is, your situation, whether there's enemies, predators around, whatever it is, all that's coming into your brain, and your brain is processing it in light of your past experience and your knowledge and your beliefs, and it's trying to spit out. A, a, a output, which is what should I do? And as your brain is processing this, it's using logic. It's going if A implies B and B implies C, your brain knows that A therefore implies C. So it's using logic, but it has different modes of reasoning. It has different ways of processing the information depending on your emotional state. So for example, if you're walking down a dark street and you're, and you're in fear, your brain will pick up any little sound that otherwise would not even register. You wouldn't know that you heard it. I mean, the sound would go in one ear and out the other and not even reach your consciousness. Uh, on the other hand, if you relax laying by the pool, that sort of thing won't, won't register with you. If you're walking down that street and you have low blood sugar, you may not be aware of being hungry because your brain is, your processing of your brain is, is focusing on some data and ignoring other data. And that's what emotions do. They, they cause you to attend to certain things, certain data, um, and to, to value it, give it certain importance and ignore other data. They, it, it emphasizes certain beliefs and experiences from your past and de-emphasizes others. And then as your A to B to C logical processing is going, it's working on all that. So they work together, but you can no more separate emotion from, ra from rational processing than you can separate the CPU of a computer from its memory and its RAM and all the data that it's working on. So it all works together. That's what we've learned in the last uh, 10 or 20 years.
Yeah, I mean, you have a great quote in the book, uh, emotion is not at war with rational thought, but rather a tool of it. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this as you were just just now talking about feedback and other things. Um, I was chatting, uh, I've never had like a career coach, but a friend was like, Meb, you should think about chatting with this person. They're amazing. And I said, sure, I'm open to it. You know, and I was talk talking to another friend as I am thinking about getting a, a coach. And they were like, why? And I said, well, I don't know. You have a golf coach. You have a Spanish teacher. Like, I don't know that many friends that are CEOs. Like, maybe I could have it. But I'll tell you something funny. Is he First thing, he sent me like a personality quiz. And I haven't gone down the road yet. But I, I filled out the, the quizzes you had in the book, listeners. So there's a, there's a couple of great uh, personality. I, I, that's the right framing of how you would say it. Um, and I was like, can I use just Mladenov's? And he's like, what book you talk? I was like, oh, the book's not even out yet. <laughs> so I was like, can't. I'm like, can I send you my answers from this so I don't have to do it again? Um, but um, but I thought it was it was fascinating. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, so you know, I think the the thing that really um, hits home for me is um, first of all, like being aware of emotions you know you talk about in your book animals have emotions but aren't necessarily like aware of them or can act on them like the cat can't pretend not to like its food you know like so some of these examples and um you know to me that seems like that's the kind of the next step of how do you integrate or understand times when they're working against you versus you can utilize them. Um, any good uh, sort of practices you've built up or ideas from the book on how we can improve that? Is it is like the first step to say, okay, I, I want to at least become aware of these feelings and emotions. How, how do you, how do you, how do you kind of approach that whole integration topic? Well, well, first I would say that the cases where emotions get in the way, unless you have an issue in a certain, if you're someone who's highly anxious or depressed or have a, an emotion, an issue, a psychological issue, uh, unless you have that, for most people, emotions are almost always uh, productive, not counterproductive. Uh, the cases where they are, are, are analogous to say in the visual system where there are optical illusions, mirages that you see, uh, cases in which your eyes or your ears uh, get tricked. Th th those do occur, and they get a lot of press when they have a spectacular uh, uh, result. Or in our lives, we think about them when, when they had a particularly um, uh, dramatic outcome. But but almost in all cases, it, 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 your emotions are are helping you. Uh, in fact, you, you wouldn't even. I talk in the book about how you really need feelings to to even get out of your chair. Uh, if you didn't have a desire, a pleasure, um, or pain, or uh, a, a reason to have a motivation that you would sit there. Uh, and when you compute, when you program computers, you realize this, if you were programming a robot, that the robot would just sit there unless you gave it a certain emotion system. I mean, you could get, tell the robot and in, in, in start listing cases in which the robot should get up. If, if I don't know if there's a if there's a bell rings get up if there's a fire get up uh, you could but you're never going to hit everything you're going to have a huge pointless kind of encyclopedia of uh, stimulus response rules for your robot and it's never going to work right but it, it, with an emotional system that is natural that motivation that that, that creates that so emo emotions are are very necessary I just want to keep emphasizing that uh, for anything that we do. Um, but it's important in, in, the, in, 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 in the, my book, I talk about the mindfulness and the importance of recognizing this effect that emotions have on your thinking um, and this kind of this aspect of emotional intelligence, which is to be aware of, of, of what's going on. And if, if you detect that, that your emotion is going off rail, which could happen, for instance, in extreme situations, that's usually when it happens because the emotions are not necessarily made for extreme modern day situations, like I talk about uh, the, the airplane that crashed uh, because uh, the test pilot uh, was in an airplane and it was vibrating so violently, he made some errors in, in calculations and mental calculations and it, and it caused it to crash. But, but generally, 
uh, those are very extreme situations. But if you do uh, detect that that an emotion is is going, you're going having excess uh, doses of, of that or functioning of that, then I talk in the book about the kinds of um, regulate, they call it emotion regulation uh, procedures that, that you can use. And there's a number of them that have been very well studied in the last uh, 10 or so years. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize suppression, which is the one that most people try to use, which is don't think about it, avoid it, bury it is, is, the, is the worst of them. Um, yeah. But there's a series of um, different things you can do uh, to, to, to uh, mitigate them when they go off rail. Um, arguably, one of my favorite stories in the book, um, which, is, <laughs> which is actually funny because it relates to uh, Wednesday is my podcast recording day, and I do two, and I was chatting with a multi-billion dollar hedge fund manager earlier, and he started talking about Epictetus, if I pronounce his name wrong, I mm -hmm. always murder it. And I was like, oh, I was just reading your story about Epictetus in like one of your pieces. He's like, what do you talk about? He's like, I don't know if I've written about Epictetus. And I was like, really? And then I thought about it and I'm like, oh crap, that's that's uh that's for my later <laughs> that's for my later podcast. But you were I was like, I've never even heard Epictetus come up in my 40 years on this planet until today, and it's twice. And so, uh, but there's a great story about um, a prisoner of war that you used to outline sort of three of these kind of approaches with acceptance, reappraisal, expression with um, uh, Stockton uh, going down it was, I think, the Vietnam War, maybe Korean War, um, that I thought was a, a beautiful illustration about sort of the, the framing of that and, and how, you know, let someone survive seven years of hardship, not just like a day or two. Yeah, and he happened to have been a uh, fan of Epic, Epictetus or Epictetus uh, um, before he was he was shot down, and so he was able then to apply that philosophy. That's the Stoic philosophy. The basis of that is really, and I'm going to oversimplify. So for, I apologize to philosophers out there. And uh, I also oversimplified in my book with Stephen Hawking, The Grand Design. I got a lot of letters about it, but. Mm -hmm. Anyway, taking a chance with the philosophers again, uh, it's really uh, the, the main tenet is not to try to change things that you have no control over. I, I like one example I use in the book where I say, um, if it rains and you're having a picnic, you don't get mad at the rain. You don't get angry at the rain, but you get angry at somebody who does something to harm you or piss you off, right? Or, you know, to... Um, it stimulates that that emotion, but uh, something harmful to you, and but often that you can't change that person, and you have no more control over that person than you do over the rain. So it's kind of equally silly uh, to be mad at that person versus being mad at, at the rain. And uh, Stockdale, and, and when he was prisoner of war, realized that, and instead of uh, being angry and and instead of I don't want to say fighting back, but instead of fighting useless battles he was going to lose with his captors, he, he exercised acceptance. He worked on accepting his situation, uh, doing his best to, to do what he could given the situation, which was very harsh, uh, a lot of uh, torture, um, beatings, lack of food and bad uh, uh, conditions. And he, he worked on accepting that that was his situation and doing the best he could within that. And others who, who didn't accept it, who reacted with anger, rebellion, who, who tried to, uh, to change things they couldn't change, often uh, became discouraged and, and, and didn't survive as well as he did. A lot of them died. And he, uh, he said, I think at one point that especially the optimists died uh, because they kept saying, I'm, you know, surely by Christmas we'll get out. And then they didn't get out. Surely by Easter we'll get out. And they didn't get out. Surely after two more years, this war will be over and it didn't end. And eventually it broke them. But by accepting his plight, he was able to survive and then live decades longer after he finally did, uh, did get out. And he, he was, by the way, was a, um, imprisoned with, along with John McCain, who was famous, uh, uh, for his time in, in, in then in the, in the same, uh, in the same camp and uh St stockdale was in for even longer than mccain yeah i think it was seven years it reminds me there's a another podcaster joker wilnick who um t does a 
He's a former Navy SEAL. He has a very simple uh, way to think about this, I, I think, in a similar topic of this sort of, um, you know, appraisal where, you know, when presented with a, a tough situation, his response as a, a very quick sort of heuristic on how to think about, you know, setting the mind right is he often responds with just the word good, like, hey, you got fired, good. Um, now it's time to find that new job you always wanted. Or like, hey, it's raining, good. We can sit home and read the books we've been meaning to do. Or hey, it's, you know, we got into a fight tonight with your spouse, good. Like, let's have this chance to unearth issues. You know, so it's just like a way of saying, instead of immediately reacting, um, you know, in a certain uh, way to acceptance and then trying to pivot it to being a, uh, you know, a, a force for positive thinking, um, to the future, but it combines both those. It's like combines acceptance of what's happened and then moving on to, uh, you know, how, how it could improve. Anyway, well, what he's I, I doing, acceptance means you accept what you, what you can't change, but the corollary of that is that, that focus on what you can change. So yeah, focus on improving the relationship with your wife or coming home and, you know, improving your, your situation by, going indoors and reading rather than crying about the rain and so forth. So yeah, it, it implies a certain action that you're taking that is an action that you, you that's possible within the constraints of the bad thing that's happening that is a positive thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I have one that's been hard for me, which was um, I really want to spend less time on, on my phone and I can see how addictive it is uh, with you know myself and everyone around me and got to the point where I was telling uh, my wife and, and others, I'm like, look, if you see me on my phone, like say something. And, um, and for the first, you know, number of times they said it, I was like, well, no, no, no. I just had to do this one work text or well, no, no, no. Like, sorry, I was just, the market's going crazy today. And then I had to finally eventually say, you know what? All right. I need to immediately respond with something else, which is that I just started saying, thank you. All right. Thank you for reminding me that I don't want to be doing this <laughs> to help me improve. And it's actually really changed the behavior where it wasn't like an immediate excuse of, no, this is why, you know, to try to actually rewire it. So it's like, accept that, yes, I'm on this too much and I want to move on anyway. Uh, it's, it's a work in progress. <laughs> We're all works um, in progress. <laughs> um, so like, so writing this book, you know, and, and I think there's probably no better, um, effort than you know writing a book or teaching something to really get deep in a subject uh what 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 is like has anything impacted you in a particular way where you you sit around and think okay um i'm going to start implementing this in my own life or i think this is a great way uh that humans should really be you know thinking about relationships with each other their approach to life whatever it may be just the, their emotions in general that that people don't do you mentioned feedback which um, I've been also a work in progress, slow to, <laughs> slow to develop, but, but I'm trying, um, anything come out in, in the process of putting the book together and publishing it? Well, you realize that you understand people better. I mean, not just yourself, which is important, but you understand people better and their decisions. And, um, so for example, uh, your, your wife, you, you want to convince her to do something. And you go Impossible. and you, you know, you're thinking about bringing up a certain question, a certain issue, but she's in a, uh, in a certain mood because uh, she's frustrated, less feeling the emotion of frustration because of something that happened earlier. And you, I realize that given the same data that I'm asking her to process when in a mood of frustration, as opposed to a mood of say joy, uh, because something amazing has just happened, right? That, that that same information will be processed differently that that and the conclusion that the person reaches will be different so it's important to realize that that when um and that's a very i think s simple uh example but but uh, i remember my old days in the corporate world when things were a little bit more more subtle and com complicated uh, it was still would have been very good for me to have realized a little bit more about how what I'm presenting, uh, proposing to uh, my colleagues or my boss in, in, uh, is, is not just going to be uh, analyzed on the basis of what I'm saying right now, but will also be analyzed on the basis of what she has been experiencing that day or that last hour. And to you know, try to be sensitive and aware of that. Uh, and, and then you'll understand better how, how the person might, might react to what you're saying. 
So that that was that's one of the uh, one of the lessons is, is that don't expect people to to react just to what you're saying. They're they're reacting to uh, to what they're feeling at the time, which may have nothing to do with you. Yeah, you know, I mean, there, there's so many little examples in your book and elsewhere that that I think are instructive here, and it's almost you know, it's almost like we all need a, a behavioral psychologist on retainer or maybe like a note card, or maybe it'll be like the Mladenov AI assistant in 10 years that'll just sit on your shoulder and say, you know what, before uh, you do uh, sentencing as a judge, you need to eat a Snickers bar, you know, or whatever it may be. But like, there are very real impacts. How do you think about um, particular audience is interested in the world of finance and investing where no um, place does emotion often create more havoc for people. Uh, often we, we talk about the benefits of having an investing plan as a way to keep you, you know, in the guardrails, but emotions when it comes to money, in addition to being a taboo subject <laughs> like emotions, it's one that is uh, emotional. So you, you've written some various stories about this area. Anything, um, any general guidelines, ideas, suggestions when it comes to thinking about money and finance with this emotional tie-in? Well, uh, I talk in the book about a study uh, by a, a guy named Fenton O'Creevy and his uh, associates in, in England, where they they studied, uh, I think, 100 plus uh, uh, traders working at f uh, four different uh, investment banks in uh, in Europe and the, and the States. And they really uh, dug deep and spent time uh, interviewing, observing them and having them a answer questions and so forth. And they they studied they got from the supervisors the ratings of these uh, investment and bankers, uh, traders, they were actually traders. Uh, and, and so they could look for correlations between their emotional approach or, or, or emotional life and, and their success. And it was very interesting what they found in this huge study, which was that the, the ones who were less successful tended to uh, suppress their emotions, try or at least try to suppress their emotions and denied the usefulness of emotion, tried to avoid emotion. And the ones who were the most successful did the opposite. They, they embraced their emotion. If they felt that their emotion was getting the best of them, they, they tried to apply these regulation, motion regulation methods, especially the one called reappraisal. Uh, but, they, but they generally tried to let their emotions guide them because they, they realized that one thing your emotion does is it, it encodes your experience from the past. So when they reach a certain situation in, in a trading day and they need a fast decision and it's high stakes, uh, just like maybe a human being in, 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 in the wilderness uh, tens of thousands of years ago might, might encounter s situations of that kind of uh, drama and importance all the time, I suppose, uh, you have to make a decision and, and you're, you're, making, you're trying to make a rational decision based on what you know, but what you know in, 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 in uh, other than that, then it's coming in through your senses, what you know in your brain from your past experience and your memory is such a, a large store and complex uh, data set that, that your conscious mind can't really handle that processing, at least not in a quick manner. And there's a lot of studies about how limited our conscious processing is. But, but what happens is on the unconscious level, that processing is happening and it's stimulating an emotion. The emotion is the messenger telling you this is dangerous or this is an opportunity or whatever it is. And, and so they understand that they should listen to their emotions and, and not uh, try to ignore them. And they did much better in, in the trading. So here's a situation where we have a, 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 a context or a realm money where we say, make rational or make objective decisions, but no, emotions are very important there. And as a physicist, I, I was happy to include another story uh, from, from my field about a very famous physicist named Paul Dirac, who was one of the top uh, handful of physicists of the 20th century and one of the pioneers of quantum theory and a very shy and retiring guy and, and, and amazingly brilliant, even beyond his, his amazing accomplishments. He was just someone that everyone recognized as being a genius. 
and and his later years people would come to him and ask him what what his advice was for a budding young physicist and he said uh, always be guided by your emotions <laughs> so he, mm. this guy was the the you know the, like the mr spock or the data of the physics world he was considered to be uh, of that type of personality and very accomplished and brilliant and yet he saw that the most important thing in 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 attack, figuring out what a problem to attack, how to attack it, and having success in physics was to listen to your emotions. It reminds me of uh, what you were talking about earlier, you know, talking about other um, writers. The, the show Billions, I think, uh, portrayed this in a pretty interesting way with hedge funds having uh, psychologists on or therapists on staff, you know, one of the highest paid parts of their business. And this is very real world where they have, you know, a lot of uh, companies famously have therapists that the traders can talk to in a way to, you know, address kind of exactly what you're talking about. Um, but, you know, the, the concept of getting them out and, and working with them versus just internalizing it, um, which seems to almost never be a, a good solution to anything really. <laughs> um, you know, um, as we think about sort of emotions, as we think about, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of going back to your your last, uh, not last book, but was the last book, um, Drunkard's Walk, um, and thinking about randomness and trying to think about world events. You know, there's been no more... Um, uh, emotional event in a while than a, a straight up pandemic, you know, and seeing uh, a lot of experiments play out, not just monetary and fiscal policy, but so sociological experiments of being in quarantine, um, you know, being, being in, in, in places. Um, I, I assume there's the good side of it, of a pandemic, which lets you write a book in, in relative peace. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had to, I, like, I thought I was going to get so much done. I was like, Oh, this is perfect. I'm going to have sabbatical. I'm going to crank out a couple books. And I don't think I wrote a single page. <laughs> um, oh, good for you. You must've found other things to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we did a little road trip, but that was, that was about it. LA. Uh, we get, we got a lot more open space out West with some family, but um, as we think about it, sort of like just where we are in 2021 it, with news and emotions um how often like i'm like reading this book I, I you know i have appreciation for narrative and how certain messages are intentionally or not unintentionally amplifying um i think an example you gave in the book about facebook and how um you know the stories being negative or positive and how they got amplified and impact it has like what's your thoughts on just like the world today like looking at some of these um giant experiments that may may not have been possible in history like a like a in these platforms that have a very real impact on you know people's day-to-day -day existence and emotions and connections to the digital world is there anything that's on your brain about that topic well i mean one that you alluded to is the, the, the idea of emotional contagion. And I explain in the book how one reason that we have emotions, certain set of emotions, uh, social emotions is to help us interact with each other and cooperate in a, in a group. Uh, humans evolved in groups of 25, 50 individuals wandering uh, nomadic uh, uh, tribes they tended to uh, kill each other if they ran into an, another one, but they were they tried then to help each other if, if they stayed in their own group. And even before language developed, uh, there had to be ways of the, the individuals uh, knowing what the others thought and supporting the others. So if, if you feel pain and your cohorts in, in your in your nomadic group don't feel the pain, they might just let you go and you and might die. Maybe you needed help. Maybe they could have, they could have helped you get through this. But if, but if you're feeling pain, uh, makes them feel pain, then they'll come and help you. 
you know, other emotions also feed into that, like affection or love. But but that's one one way that people tended to cooperate and get along together and help each other, which is by having emotional contagion and sharing the same, uh, having a tendency to share the same emotions. And uh, I remember one actor talking about how if he saw someone else about to hit someone with something, he felt that pain before the person, you know, like you're going to stab someone and then you feel that pain just watching that happen. You cringe. And, and so what happens in, in, in what happens uh, uh, in social media, of course, is it, it's a very unnatural, unnatural in the sense of uh, our uh, up, upbringing, uh, evolutionary upbringing, an unnatural artificial situation that we, we didn't evolve to be in. Uh, it's something that came up very suddenly, and and we, and our our evolutionary selves have no uh, no response to that, or haven't had one yet. It's way way too soon. So we're in this unnatural situation, and and the emotional contagion gets amplified because uh, you know nomadic tribe, you're interacting with a couple dozen other individuals, and even in uh, the societies that have grown pre pre grown up pre internet, you're probably interacting in general with. 50 people or you know how many people did you see in a day or talk to on your old phones but now that we're, we're on, as you mentioned earlier that we're on our phones all day with friends all over the world or people we don't even know uh is sharing things on instagram snapchat and facebook or whatever uh, we're suddenly in contact with a lot of other people and, and so contagion can go viral and can can really um be amplified in a way that it never could before also, the, the media has picked up on it. I think uh, Fox News is very uh, focused on fear. So people, um, if you watch the news, uh, you hear a lot of things to stimulate fear of this, fear of that. And, uh, and that all gets amplified when, uh, when people are watching that and sharing that. And then it comes on social media and it all works together to, to blow that up. So um, I don't know if I have a... Uh, a moral of that story where I want to make a moral or make a judgment on, on what that means for society. It's just something that I've observed that, that emotions through social media and in particular fear through social media and, and the traditional media uh, tend to get amplified uh, and, and can, and spread in a way that they really didn't uh, in, in the past. So that's uh, a, a new uh, one element. Of the weirder, of one of the weird examples in the book was the case of, um, the girls, uh, and you mentioned this has happened not just once in history, but many times where she developed, I think it was like a facial tick or some sort of paralysis, but then it spread to like a dozen of the friends <laughs> and, and they were like, is it something in the water? Is it something, but like this, like mutual psychosis, um, I was like, that can't be real. And then I was like, my God, that's, that's crazy where, um, you can understand, you can start to see where there's like little emotions that, uh, you're surrounded with really positive, happy people and vice versa, that it's contagious. Like that's one everyone understands. But then to an extent like this, I was like, wow, that that's really um, impactful. Like that, that's a very, you know, real. And then you realize how it gets magnified on things like, you know, Instagram, TikTok and everything else that it, it's it's a it's a very real thing. Yeah, and it was really uh, surprising to me that story and the similar ones uh, th that that you can have such uh, stark physical manifestations that are just emotional contagion. Uh, as you say, we know, and there's been a lot of studies showing that if you're in a group of if your group of uh, social uh, contacts has a higher level of happiness, it tends to make you happy, and vice versa. Uh, but uh, that that you can get, actually get a facial tick from them is is uh, was really striking. Yeah. You know, we, we talk on the podcast a lot. I say, you know, public markets investing is, is so much of the news flow is negative and noise. Like it just bombarded. You watch CNBC, you watch Bloomberg, you read, you know, listen to a lot of podcasts and it's all just like inflation and anxiety and what's gold doing or stocks expensive. What's blah, 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 all the geopolitical events. Um, and so we always try to, you know, counsel investors to, have a plan and, and put it kind of on an automation. But the, but the flip side of that is actually in the world of sort of startup investing, where you're continually exposed to companies that are new and 
uh, trying to change the world and enthusiastic and growing. And it's like a, a very strange barbell where everything is, um, the future is bright and skies are sunny and optimistic. Maybe it's just because they have a ton of VC money uh, and they can't help but be uh, optimistic. But it's an interesting sort of uh, foil or opposite to what, um, you know, so many of our investors get exposed to on on uh, a daily basis with public markets, which can be, I mean, it's a, it's a fed, fed day today. So already uh, it's just like, a, it's just a mess. Um, I loved your book. I'm not going to uh, spoil it with any more stories. Listeners, check it out. Take the quiz. Learn something about yourself. Uh, I was reading to my wife the entire page on shame and guilt last night. Uh, it's worth the price admission alone. I don't think I really understood the nuance uh, differences, but I, I think it's, um, uh, I'm going to have to go read it again to, to really let it sink in. But But it was insightful. It was something that I think I didn't know before reading the book and certainly listeners make sure you read the intro and epilogue with the book. They're um, very uh, touching as well. Um, Leonard, as you look to the future, what's on your brain? What are you thinking about? What are you excited about? What's got you excited? What's got you depressed and worried? Anything going on in the physics world? There are aliens out there. What's uh, what's on your plate? Uh, uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the, in the physics world. Uh, and I'm just waiting for it all to break, break through. You know, physics moves very slowly. Um, things can be uh, something like the Higgs particle uh, was thought of in the early 60s, and it wasn't until I think five or six years later till it was used in its current, uh, in the current uh, form. So it can take years, but there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. First of all, we know that in this, I'm sure all your listeners know that dark matter and dark energy are, are mysteries. And I, and I really feel that the answer won't come. It uh, doesn't, it's looking at least to me less and less like the answer will come from uh, a, a minimal kind of extension of our current theory called the standard model. It just seems like there's new physics there that, that will um, maybe help us revolutionize things. But there's also been some other anomalies uh, that have been found recently. I don't want to say anything technical, but uh, having to do with a, an electron and a particle called the muon that really don't match the uh, predictions of our current theory. The first time, I mean, our current theory has been tested, trilli literally trillions of, uh, of processes have been uh, uh, measured, observed, and, and the standard model has, uh, that was developed in the late 60s, early 70s has withstood every test. And uh, now there seem to be these two uh, independent uh, results that uh, that seem to uh, show that maybe maybe there's something uh, uh, something more there. May, and again, we don't know what it is. It might be a new force, new particles. Uh, maybe they can be fit in in a more traditional way, and it's just going to be an updating of the standard model, or maybe it's going to be something completely different. But uh, so these are kind of exciting things that that are coming. Uh, coming from physics. And, and again, in neuroscience, because I write my books about physics, math, uh, astrophysics, and so forth, and also psychology and neuroscience. So in that field, I'm also a little tuned in. And um, we're discovering also amazing things. Uh, our, our technologies have uh, been advancing so, so fast. I mean, if people haven't heard of optogenetics, you probably will soon. Uh, that's going to be a Nobel Prize, uh, for sure. And um, we can actually get into animal brains and turn on and off individual neurons now. Uh, also work on something called a connectome, which is a studying how not so much the, the, the physical structure of your brain, but how the neurons are connected. It turns out to be, I think, far more of the key to our, our, how our brain operates than as we used to think the, the individual structures like the amygdala and, you know, uh, it's really learning that anatomy is good, but until you understand the connections and the, the connectome of the brain, uh, you don't really know what's going on. So that's all getting to be uh, very fascinating. And we're making more advances in, um, you know, the biochemistry, knowing drugs that will affect people and how they, they work. Uh, there's the transcranial stimulation that people are working on where they put electrodes outside your 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 skull and and 
and can electrically manipulate your brain. And, and you're not and just talking about the hat you can buy at sharper image that grows your hair back, right? <laughs> no. And, and, and there are some things online that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, that I wouldn't say sharper image may have something like this. I don't think it's there yeah. yet. And yeah. in fact, uh, my friends at, at uh, Caltech would tell me, uh, don't even, uh, it, 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 they think that some of the experiments on them are, are mm, maybe, you know, not maybe they're, they're, they shouldn't be considered safe, even though they, they are and people are doing them. So you got to let that technology go a little bit, but it's, it's fascinating potential. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff. I mean, to, uh, of course, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not a geneticist, but of course that area is, is uh, you know, artificial life creating uh, DNA, creating living things, uh, unicellular living things creatures. I mean, it's amazing to live today and to see how much uh, is, is happening. I mean, I wrote my last book, Elastic, as a response to that, because knowledge is increasing exponentially. Uh, the amount of knowledge you have that, that you're going to create in the next day is based on the amount that's been done before. Okay. So when there was nothing done, it was hard to create something new. Now there's so much done. Uh, we're creating newer stuff based on that. And it's just taking off in an exponential manner. And uh, it's crazy. I can't keep up with nearly all of physics, not even my field of physics, uh, maybe my area, a subfield that I'm working on. And it's crazy, but I love to sit back and hear about what everyone's doing. And I, I, I'd love to live long enough to see some of these amazing uh, things come to fruition and change the way we think about everything. You know, um, it certainly feels like the future is bright and also going to be exciting and weird. Um, there, um, there was a fun economic paper that is from some place that I think most wouldn't expect it to be, but it was from uh, Vanguard, the investment manager, um, called the Idea Multiplier. That we'll put in the show note links, listeners. But you know, the topic was. Um, sort of looking at, you know, a lot of people will look at, you know, patents or other ways to try to gauge innovation. And they started looking at um, a, a history of the last few decades on, um, sorry, uh, actually went back further than that, I think, um, on uh, white paper citations as a way of uh, forward looking um, insight into uh productivity growth in certain industries and sectors. And, and they found that there was a very real lead time before booms in certain industries uh, and, and really high growth. Uh, and I'm going to massacre this, but there was like five industries that they identified as, as um, you know, a potential explosion in that area. It was like um, logistics. So you kind of think about everything that's going on with, with self-driving materials uh, biotech, obviously, in that world, um, and I'm blanking on the one or two, one or two others. Um, but really fun paper. We'll add it to the show note links. But it's um, certainly exciting times we live in. Um, I sent my wife uh, something from, um, I think it was your book, uh, one of your books. I don't know which one, but um, it was a. I noticed you have your name on your book, but it was a reference to. Uh, uh, a study people had done with um, uh, sending to publishers some old Nobel Prize winning books, uh, but not saying what what the what the, who the author was, and then they all got rejected. I thought yeah. she's she's an author; she's trying to publish a book, and so it, like it was particularly uh, close to home. I said, "Keep your head up, J.K. Rowling." Rejected eight forty times Nobel. Yeah, yeah. that was but that was my favorite. Yeah. One of my favorite stories. Yeah. So you didn't do this under a pen name. So uh, <laughs> listeners, you can find it on Amazon. We'll post the show note links. Um, I would love to spend another four hours with you on all your books, all your topics. We'll have to have you back one day, um, Leonard. It's been a blast. Where do people find you uh, if they wanted to keep up? You got a website? You got a place to go? Twitter? Yeah, I have a website that I don't keep up too well, but there's stuff on there, uh, leonardmiladno.com. Um, I have Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, I think it's all at L-M-L-O-D-I-N-O-W. So my first initial, my last name, which I also kind of, you know, I, 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 I keep it up, but not as much as I should, but it's just, I like to spend my time writing more than marketing, but I, I also share stuff on there. So 
uh, that's where they can find me. Or the, of course, the books are every, everywhere that sells books. So Leonard, it was a blast. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Well, thank you. It was fun chatting with you.